now that you've all had some very rich cheesecake for dessert, <laughs> we're going to keep you awake with a talk about administrative law. <laughs> That's a topic that usually makes your eyes glaze over. So I was trying to think, how do I explain administrative law to keep the, the, the crowd awake here? Um, well, I didn't read Hillary's new book, but I, I read the reviews. Um, it, it, it has a very provocative title, What Happened, which provoked a very evocative review. At this point, Madam Secretary, what difference does it make? <laughs> But in that book, she defines authoritarianism in a way that sounds like she misread George L. Orwell's 1984. <laughs> she thought that an authoritarian was someone who sows distrust toward exactly the people we need to rely on, our leaders, the press, and experts who seek to guide public policy. <laughs> So that in a capsule is what administrative law is all about. It's about rule by experts with little uh, reliance at all on the democratic process. It was put in place beginning with the, probably the Wilson administration is a good place to start with it. And the question is, is after so much time and it's become so entrenched in our, in our system, can anything be done about it? There's no question that it was contrary to our Constitution. In fact, the Wilsonian progressives will, will, would have told you that flat out. It's very contrary to the Constitution. The Constitution's an 18th century document that was good for those folks back then, but it just doesn't suit the modern world. So to discuss whether or not anything can be done about it are some folks that operate in theory and are working in the trenches. We have Michael Ullman, an attorney and political scientist, and is a research professor of politics and government at the Claremont Graduate School and a senior fellow of the Claremont Institute. He actually practiced law for many years in Washington, D.C., <laughs> um, served as an assistant attorney general under President Gerald Ford and a special assistant under President Reagan, but now has gone back to the confines of academia. It's safer there? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, immediately to his left, not politically, uh, is Damian Schiff, who is currently a senior attorney at Pacific Legal Foundation, but we hope very soon will be assuming a position as judge on the Court of Claims, just waiting for a vote by the Senate. He has over a decade of experience litigating cases in, concerning a variety of federal and state environmental land use issues, which is all administrative law. Damien was the lead attorney in Sackett versus U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, a groundbreaking decision in which the U.S. Supreme Court upheld the right of landowners to challenge the Clean Water Act compliance orders issued by the EPA. The EPA thought they could just send out a letter, require you to comply with it, um, and then not get any judicial review whatsoever. And then we have Joseph... Tartakovsky, I'm pronouncing that even close. Sorry, Joe. Perfect. <laughs> He's the Deputy Solicitor General at the Nevada Attorney General's Office, proving that we do have some good guys on the inside. <laughs> he practiced law with Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher, and uh, was formerly a James Wilson Fellow in Constitutional Law at the Claremont Institute, and a Senior Research Fellow at UC Berkeley Law, just to show you that there are some good guys at Berkeley, too. <laughs> He earned his JD from Fordham University before clerking for Judge Paul Kelly Jr. on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit. He is the author of the forthcoming The Lives of the Constitution, Ten Exceptional Minds That Shaped America's Supreme Law. So to start us off, we'll have uh, Michael Ullman, uh, followed by Damien. Each of them will have about ten minutes. Then we'll have a little back and forth between the panelists, and I'll open it up for questions from the audience. Michael. Uh, thank you, Tom. If I might uh, indulge a uh, point of personal privilege to add a uh, footnote to the uh, wonderful judge we honored at lunch, I would, I would say only this, uh, that my students often ask me uh, what good I did in government, and I committed a lot of it. And I find myself willy-nilly measuring such good as I did in negative terms. Well, I stopped this, I stopped that. So, 
<laughs> at a certain point, you're like the kid of the dike, and you're, you've only got 10 fingers, and there's the 11th leak. But there's a big exception to this, and that concerns uh, a role I played both in the Ford administration and in the Reagan administration of helping to conspire to take over the federal judiciary. This was a great positive good. Uh, and you heard John mention, uh, I had left the White House before Judge Jones was appointed. That's because I think, as I recall, we had to await a new seat on the Fifth Circuit, I think. Uh, my recollection's right. Uh, but the important point is, A, she was on everybody's short list, and she had just gotten out of kindergarten. <laughs> the, uh, uh, maybe first grade, something like that. But there was, never, there was never any doubt that she was going to the bench. And you could tell this right away from the get-go. Uh, and I don't know. You may, you may have been the youngest circuit judge, certainly in living memory, maybe in 20th century. Okay, there you go. And you're much better looking and smarter, if I may say. <laughs> but it's a, it's a, it's, I think I feel better about my peripheral role in all that than anything else. And this wonderful woman is the personification of that feeling. And I, Edith, I thank you and I salute you. For <laughs> Well, uh, as uh, Tom said, administrative law is not exactly the sexiest subject in the world, but it's something you need to know something about at the risk of perdition. And uh, the problem basically is this. Uh, what we call administrative law uh, are the, has to do with the rules and regulations concerning the rules and regulations made by all those pointy-headed bureaucrats whom you did not elect. Uh, and whom your elected representatives really don't control. And the central philosophical question is, how is it that a regime dedicated to the proposition of representative government at the beginning should end up 200 odd years later with a regime in which, give or take change, 99% of all the rules you live under are made by people whom you did not elect and over whom your elected representatives don't have very much control. That's the central dilemma facing the American constitutional system, it seems to me, at the moment. It's a structural problem of great magnitude. There are many, many felons who brought this about. Uh, Tom mentioned uh, Woodrow Wilson and the progressives uh, who gave birth to all this. But uh, like Topsy, it just keeps growing and growing and growing. And what to do about it is a very hard problem uh, to solve. Uh, its constitutional difficulties are numerous, but I'll mention the two greatest ones. In order to have rules and regulations, they must be made by someone. Congress doesn't wish to make them, and so it delegates legislating authority to departments and agencies, some of which belong directly to the president, others of which are so-called independent agencies, uh, but those are the bodies to which Congress uh, writes legislation, authorizes them to write uh, rules and regulations, those things that you love so much and spend so much of your time uh, uh, wrestling with. At the early stages of the uh, administrative uh, regime, Congress kept watchful control, more or less, over what they delegated. That stopped, really, in the 1960s. I will mention only one note about this in passing. Uh, the original range of, of regulatory agencies dealt with discrete industries, and the regulations affected those industries directly and, and uh, almost exclusively. Banking, securities, uh, uh, radio and, and later television organizations. Didn't affect the average citizen directly very much. Indirectly, yes, but not directly. Then, beginning in the late 50s and running through the early 70s, there were created more administrative agencies than existed in the entire history of the United States hitherto. All hell broke loose in the 1960s. Uh, and what it produced was this explosion in regulatory activity. Uh, you can measure it in the number of pages in the Federal Register where proposed rules and regulations are published. And that curve looks like this in the 1960s. Second feature of that explosion is that unlike the first wave of regulation, the regulation 
reach now deeply into the personal lives of citizens, right across the board from, from labor law to civil rights law to housing law, you name it, it now touches the average citizen in a very direct and uh, potentially draconian way. And we've been paying the price for that ever since. As you had this escalation in the number and, and quality, if you like, of regulations, Congress learns to live with this in a very mischievous kind of way. And the old congressional attitude, even among New Deal members of Congress, was we got to keep an eye on these guys. By the time you get to the 60s and 70s, they let them float by themselves while retaining the authority to tweak it behind the scenes by phone calls and letters and appointments and things like that. But in terms of policy, they like to play dumb. And maybe some of you have received those letters from members of Congress. Uh, the very members who voted for the authorization of regulations now issued by the XYZ agency, and you complain about it, and they will write you a letter and say, that's terrible what that agency is doing. <laughs> Nobody ever holds them accountable that they passed, they passed the rule that made the obnoxious regulation possible. That is the problem from the congressional point of view. It involves the delegation of legislative authority that rightly understood the separation of powers not only doesn't authorize, but in fact set its face against. There's a second problem with this, and it has to do with the judiciary. Under a body of law known as the Chevron Doctrine, after a case that was decided in the early 80s, your Supreme Court, uh, decided that there should be judicial deference to, to agencies when they interpret statutes passed by Congress. Uh, and if there's any ambiguity in the statute, nobody could ever argue about the word, what the word ambiguity meant, of course, but in the opinion of the Supreme Court, when there's an ambiguity in the statute, the agency receiving the delegated authority gets to decide how to resolve that ambiguity. What could go wrong? Uh, it followed that up some years later with a case known as the Our Case, A-U-E-R, in which the same group of worthy justices decided that the agency gets to interpret its own regulations by deference of the courts. So the courts have now taken themselves out of the business of reviewing regulations. The legislature has taken itself out of the business of writing authorizations with any sort of detail, and you, boys and girls, are the recipients of this constitutional wonderland. That is the world of administrative law. Now, the good news is that you have some movement on the high court. Uh, believe it or not, uh, my late and dear friend, Antonin Scalia, who authored the Chevron decision, he was heretical on that issue, but moving a little bit. <laughs> He also authored the Hour decision, but he had backed off Hour. In fact, the last conversation we had before his untimely death concerned this, in which I gently chastised him. No one ever <laughs> gently chastised Nino about anything, and he would not gently chastise back, but that's who he was. I miss him more than I can say. Uh, but we argued about it. To know Nino was to have a good argument about almost anything. We argued about this. His position on Chevron deference remained somewhat gospel-like. And it was that Congress and, and, and the executive are all big boys. They know, what, they know what they're doing. And if Congress wants to delegate more or less open-ended authority to an agency, we don't want the damn judiciary second-guessing that. That grew out of an experience he and I and others had with the D.C. Circuit in the 1960s and 70s, which went crazy and started second-guessing every regulation in sight. And that was very much fixed in Scalia's head, and I think that's the true background of what led to his dogmatism on the subject of Chevron. But uh, beginning about, what, 10, 12 years ago, John would know better than I, Clarence Thomas began to rethink his own position on this. Uh, and began to re-examine the principal basis of, of delegated authority, and has become increasingly articulate and increasingly sophisticated on the subject of delegated uh, legislative authority, which he thinks is spinach and to hell with it, uh, and as well criticizing the judiciary for failing to exercise its judicial power in overseeing overreaching regulations. Uh, that's a good movement on his part. He's beginning to get some traction first in the law reviews, 
uh, and among serious students of the law, but as well among his colleagues. He's had some influence, I think, on Justice <coughs> Alito, as well as on the Chief Justice. You have, I think now, three, arguably four, Kennedy waffles, uh, three and a half votes for re-examination of judicial deference uh, to regulations. And now you have Judge Gorsuch from the Tenth Circuit who is absolutely terrific on these issues. He has written a couple of piping good decisions when he was on the Tenth Circuit, sharply questioning both the uh, legislative delegation and judicial deference to regulations. I think he is going to be a terrifically strong influence on the court for the better. And while I don't normally bet on these things, especially with Justice Kennedy, I think we have four reasonably solid votes, maybe on a good day, Kennedy as well, to have some wind back of our almost certainly, uh, so the agencies will not have the exclusive monopolistic power to, to determine the breadth and scope of their own regulations. And I think eventually it will lead to some cutback, not an abolition, I don't think, but some cutback on the Chevron doctrine itself. So I'm mildly optimistic on this front. And what we need is another appointment like Neil Gorsuch, and then I'll sleep better at night. <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and I want to, uh, to again thank the, uh, the Claremont Institute for hosting today's uh, celebration in honor of the Constitution and Constitution Day, and I think that there is a, a closer relationship between the Constitution and the rights we enjoy under it and administrative law than seems at first glance uh, the case, and that is not just from what Professor Ullman was just talking about with respect to how nowadays most actual government power is wielded directly by government agencies, but also because uh, our constitutional rights are to some extent a function of to the extent to which the judiciary will actually review the lawmaking or the adjudication of administrative agencies. And that's a, a part of judicial or of administrative law that I'd like to, to, uh, to focus my, uh, my remarks on this afternoon. I recall this morning that uh, um, Professor Eastman mentioned that uh, our panel on ad law will be a little on the dry side. And so I thought, well, that's just perfect because I'll be talking mainly about Clean Water Act cases that uh, <laughs> deal with recent Administrative Procedure Act developments that I think have a nice connection between the rights that we enjoy under the Constitution and how those are vindicated through judicial review of agency action that itself might violate those rights. In, in, in thinking about my remarks uh, uh, today, I. I thought, well, you know, when you think about administrative law, you think of the Administrative Procedure Act, which is a statute that Congress enacted in 1946 that kind of sets forth the constitution for administrative agencies in the modern state or in the modern federal government. But the reality is that there was ad law going on for a long time prior to 1946. And uh, I found what I think to be maybe the first ad law case, if not the first, certainly one of the more interesting ones, but I'm curious whether anybody else knows of United States versus Norse. Is that a case that, that anybody has ever heard of before? Good, so my ignorance was not quite as embarrassing as I thought it was going to be, because I thought, this is, this is amazing. 1835, Chief Justice John Marshall writing for the court. The case was about a dispute between the Treasury Department and a former Treasury official. The, uh, the way the Treasury at that time got a lot of federal revenue was that it would hire people to collect receipts for the federal government. And uh, the process would be that the agents would go out, collect the money, and then they would have to draw up a bill of accounts and then return to the Treasury what was it owing from their collection activities. And Mr. Norse uh, did all that, but he took a cut because he thought, <laughs> I'm entitled to a commission under um, maybe general commercial law or what have you. But because of that, the Treasury Department said, wait a second, you owe us about $11,000, which in the early 1830s was no small sum. And so what did the Treasury Department do? Well, it relied upon a recently passed law 
that gave the Treasury Department the power to issue what was called a distress warrant. And the distress warrant was a powerful process at law that basically allowed the feds to tell the U.S. Marshal to go and take all of Mr. Norris's property and sell it, and no judicial review. He had no authority to countermand that distress warrant, at least under the statute. So what did he do? He filed uh, an action for an injunction in district court in D.C., uh, arguing that um, that the uh, distress warrant was improper because, in fact, he did properly collect all of his receipts and that he was entitled to this commission. And uh, Chief Justice John Marshall, writing for the court, said this, it would excite some surprise if in a government of laws and of principle furnished with the department whose appropriate duty it is to decide questions of right, not only between individuals, but between the government and individuals, a ministerial officer might, at his discretion, issue this powerful process and levy on the person, lands and chattels of the debtor, any sum he might believe to be due, leaving to that debtor no remedy, no appeal to the laws of his country if he should believe the claim to be unjust. But this anomaly does not exist. This imputation cannot be cast on the legislature of the United States. So, in uh, classic uh, declamatory fashion, Chief Justice uh, Marshall says that um, we're going to imply a right of judicial review, even though Congress hasn't expressly said that there, such a right exists, because if we don't have that right uh, of judicial review, then the underlying rights of Mr. Norris would be violated. And that, I think, is not only a great example of early administrative law, but it's also a great example of administrative law done right which is administrative law is not about making administrative agencies more efficient. It's about ensuring that when they exercise their power, the rights of those against whom that power is levied is done so in a constitutional way. So fast forward from 1835 to 1946. The Administrative Procedure Act was passed. Basically, the point of, of the Administrative Procedure Act was a compromise between those new dealers who really liked what New Deal agencies were doing and wanted to dial back on judicial review, and those in Congress who weren't so keen on what the alphabet soup agencies were doing and thought, we want to ensure that there's a strong right of judicial review in our federal courts. And so the APA was essentially a compromise, but a compromise, in my view, more on the side of judicial review, that in fact there should be a right to sue an agency whenever your basic liberties are being infringed by administrative action. Unfortunately, over the 50 years, 60 years from the passage of the APA, the federal courts weren't quite as faithful to that, uh, to that charge of protecting individual liberty in administrative law and instead seemed to adopt more of the New Dealer compromise that we should give administrative agencies more room to breathe. Now this evidence itself in a lot of ways, it, prominently in the two cases that uh, Professor Ullman mentioned, the Chevron case and our case, which basically give administrative agencies a lot of uh, deference when they interpret legal text. But also at the same time that the Supreme Court was issuing these agency-friendly rulings on deference, the court was also narrowing the scope of judicial review. And so you have cases like um, Block versus Community Health Institute, Thunder Basin Coal Company, and then um, more recently, Bennett v. Speer, where the court, through interpretations of what final agency action means or interpretations of how strong is the presumption of judicial review that the APA establishes, the court basically narrowed when a property owner, when an individual citizen can sue an agency for relief for the violation of his or her property rights or other liberties. Until the last five or six years, where in two cases, the Supreme Court, in my view, has started to turn the page. And not, um, not uh, uncoincidentally, at the same time that we also start seeing the court suggesting that maybe these deference doctrines aren't so great. A friend of mine says that you don't really have a doctrine in, in, in judicial law, uh, federal law, unless you can uh, refer to it in two case names. So there's the Rooker-Feldman doctrine, or uh, there's the Nolan-Dolan doctrine uh, and land use exactions. Well, I'm going to advocate for what I call the Sackett-Hawks doctrine, which is um, a doctrine of administrative law that I think has arisen out of two cases, Sackett versus EPA from 2012, 
and Army Corps of Engineers versus Hawks Company from 2016. Both these cases deal with the, the Clean Water Act. Both deal with judicial review of actions taken by the EPA and the Army Corps under the Act. The particular facts aren't as important as what I think the takeaway from these cases is. And the takeaway is that now, going forward, I think that an agency needs to show if it wants to preclude judicial review. The landowner says, hey, I'm being told by this agency that I can't use my property, or I've been issued this order that if I don't institute this mitigation plan, I'm going to be liable for tens of thousands of dollars per day in fines. In those circumstances, the court's saying that the agencies must articulate an exceedingly high justification or standard in order to defer judicial review that, in fact, the presumption of judicial review that the APA uh, uh, codified is alive and well, and that going forward, I think we're going to see the, the High Court more and more receptive to claims of, of judicial review of agency action, even action that might have been described 10, 15 years ago even as unreviewable pre-enforcement action. Where do I think this will turn uh, most uh, uh, most sharply next, I think, in terms of, of judicial review of so-called discretionary action. One of the exceptions that agencies have regularly relied upon to avoid being hauled into court by, by individual citizens is this, this doctrine that, that if they have been granted discretionary authority by Congress, Therefore, the federal courts have no manageable standard or no means of reviewing whether or not the exercise of that discretion is constitutional or whether it's otherwise legal under the APA or, or any appropriate statute. I suspect that that will be the next focus of the court in terms of reining in some of the discretion of administrative agencies and also at the same time beefing up the, uh, the importance of the presumption of judicial review. Now, this has most recently been, been discussed by the court and, and ruled upon by the court in the context of environmental law, but I don't think it's limited at all to environmental law. In fact, a lot of the, the uh, cases more recently that have gone up to the Supreme Court uh, concerning administrative law don't deal at all with environmental law, deal with labor law or, or deal with, with even, even more um, uh, controversial social issues about, for example, transgender bathrooms and, and the requirements of schools to provide them. So ultimately, I think that goes to show that as administrative law develops, so in an inverse way do the, the strengths of our constitutional liberties. Your rights are not worth much unless you have a remedy for them. For most people, that remedy comes from administrative law to the extent that agencies are hemmed in in their discretion to the extent that they can be called out for illegality through an action in court. To that extent, it makes our own liberties under the Constitution safer. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Joseph Tartakovsky. I'm the Deputy Solicitor General of Nevada. I'm, I'm here today in my personal capacity, but I do have the pleasurable occupation of spending the better part of each day litigating against the federal <laughs> administrative state. I want to thank Ryan Williams for, for inviting me. Thank John Eastman for having me. John's been a great mentor to me, as I'm sure he has for many of you. I feel like I'm really doing what John wanted me to do. Woodhouse said that a burglar is just a practical socialist. People talk about <laughs> people talk about the redistribution of property, but the burglar goes out and does it. <laughs> we talk about taking down the administrative state, but a deputy solicitor general gives up a substantial private sector salary and goes and files lawsuits all day in the trenches. Um, I shouldn't say it's just me. I mean, the, the very fact that you have a crowd like this, I mean, that of all the things you could be doing on a sunny Saturday to come here and to sit and talk about the Constitution all day is a, is a, is a really lovely thing. I think, I think we're kind of, you're my kind of people. Every day is Constitution Day for us, I think. So let me share just a few thoughts that I've learned working in a state attorney general's office 
and also some research I've done on a, a book that's coming in next year. Let me respectfully suggest that what we call the administrative state, a dizzying array of agencies, the vast bodies of law made and enforced by bureaucrats without much presidential or congressional activity, is not the brainchild of Woodrow Wilson or part of a progressive conspiracy, but the product of 230 years of almost unabated American growth and expansion. If you asked Thomas Jefferson who the father of the administrative state was, he would have said Alexander Hamilton. And both Republicans and Democrats since then have steadily built on Hamilton's edifice. And until FDR, it was probably more associated with Republicans or proto-Republicans like Henry Clay and Daniel Webster, the guys in office at the time of this special warrant. We've come so far that we can scarcely recall where we started. This year marks the 90th anniversary of the, the Mississippi floods of 1927, worst flooding in American history, rained for 30 days straight, created a lake 150 miles wide where there had been no lake before, hundreds of thousands of people displaced, and Calvin Coolidge resolutely refused to visit the disaster area. He believed that he had a solemn constitutional duty not to do so because that would create a federal precedent for disaster relief with environmental disasters. <laughs> now, a few, now, a few weeks ago, I was at a fundraiser. Mike Pence was supposed to be the headliner. But it turned out that Hurricane Harvey was going to hit that day. And he instantly canceled without a second thought. There were 3,000 people there because Vice President Pence believed that he had a solemn constitutional duty to be on hand to oversee the federal disaster relief. And all the people at this event, all committed constitutional conservatives, nodded their head and said, quite right. Presidential power has expanded. Federal authority over new areas of life has expanded. And with it, quite inevitably, the administrative state has expanded. This is true in areas ranging from dealing with Chinese Steel dumping, food and drug testing, dealing with Albanian crime cartels. I will, I, I will suggest that if you dig deep, you will find that often a lot of the administrative state began with a good policy reason, that it um, involves something that states individually can't do, and that has deeper roots than you might think. And let me just give you one example to illustrate that. Something that's on, on the minds of many Americans right now, especially if you have family back east. And I think it affected our honoree uh, today. This is hurricanes. Deep within the Department of Commerce is an $8 billion agency called the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Within that is something called the National Weather Service. Deep within that is something called the Centers for Environmental Prediction. And within that is a 60-person agency based in Miami called the National Hurricane Center. This agency, it's the only one that does it. Their job is to gather reliable and accurate data in order to predict when hurricanes are going to hit. And they're pretty good at it. They can tell us, for instance, that a hurricane is going to hit at 8 AM on a Sunday on a Florida coast. And by doing so, they save thousands of lives. It used to be an inevitability that a major hurricane might kill two or 3,000 people. There was one in Galveston in 1900 that killed 6,000 people. Now, this, now this, this, this agency does, it has all the indicia of the, of the most hateful elements of the administrative state. It's totally immune to political influence, chock full of experts, two-thirds of them have PhDs in things like climatology and meteorology, and it was created by Lyndon Johnson, the great state builder. This agency does things that no state can do. They're able to do this because they have satellites in the sky. They have a national network of radar on the ground. They have buoys deep in the Caribbean that chart wind and weather patterns. Um, they have uh, access to these Hercules hurricane hunters. These are these giant planes that can fly into the eye of the storm, courtesy of the United States Air Force. No state can afford to do that. No state wants to be saddled with that kind of expense, leaving aside the coordination problems that would result. Now why, now, why does this matter? Why, why do I think this is an important premise from which to begin our consideration of the administrative state? 
I think it's because by attacking an abstract administrative state, we fail to see the true problem. We let the true culprit get away. And that culprit, if, if culprit is not too strong a word, is Congress. There is no administrative agency, however old, however powerful, that a, ter uh, that a determined Congress could not abolish tomorrow. The fact that it is talked about and not done says something about the views of the American people, but also, as Professor Ullman has said, the Congress has got quite used to this, especially in its responsibility dodging potentialities. Take public lands. People back east may not be aware that the federal government owns a third of the real estate in the United States. It's all located in 10 western states. They have the power to manage this the way a state would manage its state property. Not only have, has this gotten more complex because there's so many decisions to make, which used to be done in congressional committees, which actually in their sort of secretive nature rather resembled agencies, but there's so many decisions, but they're, they're always very fraught. If you give federal land to the mining industry, the ranchers may be irritated. If you give it to the ranchers, the conservations may be angry. So the Congress found that in the 70s, you transfer, you delegated this to these federal land agencies like the Bureau of Land Management, you could take credit when things go right. And you could rail against the agency when things go wrong with the parties affected. A second thought, our courts the answer. Let me just raise an issue here. If you, if we, we say, well, what is the problem with the administrative state? You have unelected officials with substantial power over our lives and liberties, totally immune to normal democratic processes. Kind of sounds a lot like courts to me, except that courts are even more final, more powerful. If you're in a, a court decision, uh, an agency decision can be an error, a court decision can be an error and a precedent, and it'll trip you up in future cases, and we see it all the time in Nevada. You can call an agency and berate them for getting the facts wrong. You can't do that with a court, and I've tried both. <laughs> I suggest, my suggestion is, is the transfer of the decision-making power from agencies to courts simply moving it from one group of unelected individuals to another? Is it really a solution? And one last point about why I think a frank reckoning of the dimensions and the history of the administrative state is important. I worry that the, the suggestion that we're living under some sort of post-constitutional regime is very damaging to our constitutional culture. Thomas Jefferson for years kept up an attack on the Washington administration as a sort of proto-monarchy. And Hamilton said, you stop it, it's not true, but you're undermining the legitimacy of the government on which we all depend. I, I worry that if, if, if we as constitutional conservatives are not selective about our attacks and we attack the amorphous administrative state without finding which has values and which parts, which certainly are, unconstitutional, outdated, positively harmful. If we don't focus, we risk becoming so many um, Rick Perry's. Now, you may recall what I mean, you may recall that when he was campaigning for the Republican nomination, he suggested he was going to abolish, among other things, the Department of Energy. It would have got rid of hundreds of agencies at one fell swoop. Now, now, he is now the Secretary of Energy. <laughs> and when asked how he reconciles these two things, he said, I just, I didn't realize all the important things it did. <laughs> like, it is useful, for instance, to have a central regulation of nuclear energy. So that's why I think if we remain cautious and prudent and conservative without being reactionary, I think we can start making some progress. And the fact that you have a room full of people willing to grapple with the administrative state on a Saturday makes me think that eventually we can get there. Thank you so much. Okay, for our panelists, um, the Chevron Doctrine was one of the, the items mentioned. That's where the court defers to the agency. And it was mentioned that it came about because the D.C. Circuit was second-guessing the agencies um, and was uh, going full tilt to implement the law it wanted Congress to have passed. Um, 
And that's why Justice Scalia seemed to, to be a, an adherent. But as Joe just pointed out, uh, are we any better off if we just shift it back to the courts? Uh, Michael, what do you think the solution is? How much time do you have? <laughs> Ten seconds. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah I, the, it's, it's a terrific question, and it's, it's something one has to take into account. Uh, there's an institutional economy problem here with Chevron. You simply cannot take all of these rules. Uh, and, and in a typical case, a, a rule of an agency will have multiple hundreds of thousands of pages in the record. You can't ask federal judges to review that for sufficiency of evidence or even in many respects due process elements. It's an upper limit institutionally on that. Unless you want to create an administrative law court, which has been an idea that's kicked around for a while, uh, but uh, that's a whole separate issue. But the this core problem is it's, it's the size of government. And let me take issue with my learned brother Tartakovsky. I don't think he spent enough time in Claremont before he went off to law school. He ought to, <laughs> he ought to have taken another semester in administrative law with a certain professor who remained unnamed. Either that or he doesn't have enough gray hair and scar tissue in litigating with the EPA. That will give you religion, trust me on this, especially if it deals with something like Superfund. It isn't NOAA that's the problem, right? And by the way, you're wrong. Congress is all over NOAA, and the people in NOAA know it, all right? They know exactly how to tweet members of Congress uh, to make sure they're on their side. A friend of mine, Glenn Schlady, during the Reagan administration, the number three guy in OMB, was chuckling one morning in the White House mess, and he had the copy of the Washington Post saying there was a whole spate of stories, California's real, the big one is coming. The big one, the guys from the JPL and otherwise, boom, boom, boom. And Glenn says it happens every other year. I said, what do you mean? He says, well, they're getting ready for the authorization hearings. <laughs> <laughs> and sure enough, you can, you can set a clock by this. Within a month of the authorization appropriation hearings for the, uh, who's the outfit that does the earthquakes? The, 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 USGS. USGS. Sure enough, there's a whole spate of stories. You'll see it on TV. The big one is coming. It's just around the corner, and we need another 200 agents. And blah, blah. So that's part, part of the problem is that nickel-dime graft. That's less problematic. The bigger problem is the open-ended quality of the legislative delegations of the sort that EPA does uh, and other agencies like that. It isn't the, the narrow technical agencies. You can have those. They are not a threat much in the way of liberty. EPA is. Uh, EEOC is. They have these open-ended delegations. Uh, one way to, to look at this, uh, my friend Gary Lawson, who teaches wonderfully admin law at BU, he said, suppose there's a goodness and niceness agency created by Congress with the mandate, the agency shall go and do goodness and niceness as it sees fit. That's the problem with the administrative state. A properly delegated piece of authority says, we believe in goodness and niceness, and here are 14 criteria that the agency needs to follow as a function of due process and constitutionality and political accountability, and that shall pass such rules and regulations as may be necessary to comply with these 14 criteria. That's a perfectly valid delegation, and you can have a pretty sizable government right, with that. That's not what we have now. We have these open-ended delegations. And if you compound the felony, if I can put it that way, with, with judicial deference, what you have is a lot of arbitrariness and caprice, which raises huge constitutional problems. A, B, and I'll all shut up. This was brought to you by Woodrow Wilson and the progressives. They knew exactly <laughs> what they were doing. They set about purposely to undermine the idea of the separation of powers precisely because it produced too much political accountability <coughs> in Congress, which they wanted to undermine because they thought it was politically controlled and they wanted to replace it with the rule by experts, all of whom, as you know, are neutral politically. <laughs> That's the administrative step. <laughs> So, so Damien, <laughs> as a litigator in the field, is there any third way we, we, can, we can get rid of Chevron and go back to the courts making all the decisions, or we can magically expect good people to be elected to Congress who will take back their authority? What's the third way? Well, I, I, I think the, the third way could be um, uh, as uh, Professor Ullman was, was suggesting to have 
for one, tighter delegations to agencies, because uh, I think that um, uh, if Congress were to be clearer in what precisely it wants, then we wouldn't have all the disputes about whether we should defer to agencies in interpreting ambiguous text. Now, that there's a reason, of course, for why Congress uh, uh, oftentimes legislates in a, uh, a vague manner because politically it's not sensible to take a public position on a lot of issues and it's better to shift it over to um, to the agencies. But, uh, but in addition to that, uh, you can also uh, actually require, for example, the existing Administrative Procedure Act to be enforced as it was written. I mean, the APA, for example, says that questions of law will be decided by the court. And I think if you look at the, the history of the APA, it was pretty clear that that meant that agencies wouldn't get deference. And yet you have these doctrines like Chevron and our that seem to run counter to that. Uh, by the same token, you also have in the, um, uh, in the APA the idea that a lot of what these agencies would have been doing should have been formal rulemaking or formal adjudication that, uh, that then would require uh, participants in these administrative processes to have more rights in the administrative process as opposed to having an informal rule that uh, provides just some notice and some opportunity for comment but no real opportunity to protect yourself. And thirdly, even in informal rulemaking, the APA seems to suggest that on questions of fact, the uh, courts should be able to conduct de novo review more often so that you don't have this knee-jerk deference to agency fact-finding that so often is used to effectively um, uh, rubber stamp agency uh, decision-making. So I think the bottom line is I have nothing actually new to respond to, <laughs> to, to Tom's, uh, to, to Tom's uh, question other than to say this, and that is uh, the importance of this question of do we want the courts having more power, do we want Congress having uh, more responsibility in legislating more particularly, do we want agencies to have more leeway? The importance of that question is a direct function of the amount of government power that's at play. So to the extent that, that um, the government can only run a post office, then I don't really care whether that's simply um, a, a, an administrative matter or whether the courts have judicial review. But the problem is that because government itself has now been considered to have so much more authority that otherwise, from the founders' perspective, would have been considered uh, excessive, that these questions uh, of how to rein in that excessive government power and how best to divvy it up so it's not abusive become more significant. But in my experience, I would, I would rather have uh, these questions decided by a judiciary than by um, agencies, if for no other reason that, than, than that agencies and their staffers typically are not neutral decision makers. Even though they may think they are, they only got to that position because they have a certain policy bias. You don't work for the EPA unless you have a fundamental idea that the environment is not in good shape and the best way to improve the environment is through government regulation. Otherwise, it just wouldn't make sense for one to get into that career path. And so even if, as an administrator, you believe I am being absolutely unbiased in my decision making, I think it's much more likely that you will have unfair results being produced by that kind of a person than by, say, a judge generalist, who doesn't necessarily have any particular uh, uh, policy interest, or at least not a strongly developed one, in any of the myriad issues that, that, that are now decided in the first instance by, uh, by administrative agencies. So on that score alone, I would feel more comfortable uh, with, a, uh, with a lot of the decisions being decided principally by a court rather than by, by agency staff. Okay. Damien, your, your homework is to go read the collected decisions of Jay Skelly Wright. Um, <laughs> so Joe, I, before I open it up to the audience, I want to give you the last word on is there a solution to this Chevron conundrum? You, courts, agencies, Congress, where's the solution? Well, well, in answer to Professor Yuman, my old professor, um, yeah, I do think it's I do I do agree that uh, Congress, with certain agencies, is overseeing them, and that's why it's so useful. I mean, if I have a problem with an agency, if the state of Nevada has a problem with an agency, we can put in a call to the United States Senate or have him put in a call 
you can't do that with a court. Um, courts are knowledge, uh, agencies are knowledgeable and sometimes biased, but sometimes you want someone with subject matter expertise. It's hard to teach a court. They can get things wrong. They, 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 they don't see things. They can cause disasters that they're not even aware of because they're not familiar with it. And um, you know how long it takes to get through a court? I mean, get resolution of something through a court? I mean, you're, being, you're in for years. One point about Woodrow Wilson. <laughs> I have to appeal to the audience. Now, you <laughs> appeal to the audience to, to read his writings for yourself. He's, he's not my hero, but he's also one of the most formidable political thinkers that American history has ever produced. What Michael is talking about is a position, something he wrote in 1885 called Congressional Government. It's a very trim book. And he's quite clear about what his argument was. In 1885, we, he said, we are living in an age of congressional government. He said the founders' plan, the tripartite plan, is totally out of whack because the president is a non-entity. He's Congress's water boy. This is at a time when it was thought improper for a president to go to Congress in person to speak. That was a separation of powers violation. Now, Washington did it, but Jefferson said, oh, that's what the kings do. You can't do it. This is, this is 1885, this is right, this is right when Joe Cannon take, uh, is about to take power, uh, Tom Reed. It, we, we can't even imagine how powerful Congress was and how ineffectual the president was. And he just says, let's have a little bit more presidential leadership. You should, I think um, his second term was basically swallowed up by the First World War. This, these, these, are, these are Woodrow Wilson's legislative accomplishments from his first term. This is Woodrow Wilson's contribution to the administrative state. The Federal Reserve Act, the Clayton Antitrust Act, and the Federal Trade Commission Act. Those are the three things he did in his first term. I have not met a conservative that wants to repeal any of those laws. <laughs> he gets too much credit, which is to say too much blame. Very good. So I'm going to open it up to the audience. We have a few minutes left. If you would like to speak, please raise your hand and we'll have a microphone brought to you. So who's still awake after this discussion of administrative law? <laughs> Question right back here. Um, hello. I wanted to ask a question. Um, now, uh, uh, I think the uh, idea is to um, uh, have the courts or the federal judiciary at least uh, to uh, have the power to review these administrative uh, agencies. Uh, what I'm thinking, uh, uh, isn't the judiciary, the federal judiciary at least, part of the federal government and they would basically uh, want more expansion of the federal government as it has been. Uh, so is it realistic to expect the federal judiciary yes. To, to shrink this uh, exploding power? Um, or uh, is there any other solution to that? For example, uh, what if there is more autonomy given to the states to take care of some of their problems that the uh, agencies are expected to, to take care of? Well, I have two quick answers. As to the, your first question, you simply need to uh, read the collected opinions of the judge we honored at lunch today. All right? That gives the answer to your question. No, judges aren't wholly owned subsidiaries of this abstraction known as the federal government. All right? uh, they take an oath to do that. Some are better at this and some are worse. There are ways in which the judiciary can, in fact, be useful in trimming back overreach on the part of open-ended delegations. There's some interesting examples of this. Uh, I can think of two off the top of my head, uh, both from judges in the D.C. Circuit, uh, Janice Brown and Doug Ginsburg, have written very interesting opinions uh, that, based on due process grounds, seek to cut back on, on, on the, the abuse of, of uh, open-ended authority on the part of agencies. I can tell you this from a long experience in wrestling with agencies in Washington. Uh, Appellate courts don't have to do this very often. Often enough, don't ask me how that is, the agencies will get the point 
we just spent, you know, 35,000 man years producing a regulation to, to take care of automobile bumpers, and this damn judge just threw it into a cocked hat. They will rethink very precisely how they exercise their discretion. Congress will also rethink this. So the judges, rightly educated in the Claremont manner, of course, <laughs> uh, have, a, have a magisterial function in teaching Congress and the agencies what the separation of powers rightly understood means, at the, underneath which lies this principle of political accountability on the part of Congress and the part of agencies. That's the principal role of judges in policing this administrative state, it seems to me. And I think it can be done without they themselves becoming just another damned administrative court. So. Joe, any thoughts? Okay. okay. Time for one more question. <laughs> right here. Just hold on, we'll get you a microphone. It's coming. Well, since we talk about the Constitution and uh, federalism, um, the size of the federal government has grown, as you pointed out, but several things that the federal government does don't belong at the federal level, and or at least, you know, there is very little evidence in the Constitution that they belong to uh, the federal level. And maybe the federal government should indeed, and Congress should decide, to delegate much more to the states. Everybody uh, has been talking about the Department of Education, if that should be at the federal level, or that the states themselves should decide. Uh, it may very well be that the federal government is overburdened because they have taken on things that they should not have taken on. Any comment? Yes. Okay. <laughs> and on that note, the, the solution to the administrative state. So I want to join me in thanking our panel. Tell me I still love you, you know. <laughs> 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 <laughs>